on behalf of the pharmaceutical analysis department babatla college of pharmacy yeah. i hold heartily welcome the dignitaries the professors associate professors assistant professors and the student community for this wonderful evening so on behalf of our management department of pharmaceutical analysis i warm welcome to all the participants of course our academic friends are good enough in terms of academic aspects of various analytical methods that may be analytic estimation of apa or estimation of the drug from dissolution of fluid as well as biological fluids but in case of potent medicaments the normal biovalidation or biological method is not sufficient then we have to go for sophisticated techniques like lcms dry spot technique etc etc and such kind of knowledge is scanty for for our academicians similarly impurity profiles so the collection of impurities is very difficult in academic institutions and hence we are handicapped in conducting such kind of research work though they are having good knowledge but practically because of certain limitations or constraints we are not in a position to do it so such kind of knowledge is going to be shared by eminent personalities during this three days short term training program i am very much happy with the participation of eminent faculty and the institution by our pharmaceutical analysis department the hod and other faculty members who took a lot of efforts by gathering the information from the research persons and conducting such kind of activity i am very much happy and on behalf of our organizing committee i once again whole heartedly welcome all the participants and definitely you will have a good knowledge on the advanced analytical techniques which are used in the pharmaceutical industry and today's speaker dr pawan garu and uh, dr pawan garu profile is going to be introduced by sushma so sushma you hand over and introduce dr pawan thank you sir i am sushma an assistant professor from babatla college of pharmacy and it's a great privilege to tell about our speaker that is dr pawan kumar pratipati sir did his b pharmacy from pullareddy college of pharmacy hyderabad in 2003 and he graduated m pharmacy from vinayaka mission university in 2006 and sir completed his phd from krishna university in 2016 and later on he did mba from clayton university usa and to come his job profile pawan sir worked as a research scientist in apotex research private limited for 3 years and then after he worked as a senior scientist in acutest research laboratories for 3 years and then after he moved to analytical and bioanalytical development vanta biosciences chennai and there he worked for 2 years and currently dr pawan kumar sir is holding the position of post doctoral research associate in crichton university usa he is working there since october 2015 and coming to the scientific experience of our speaker that is pavan kumar pratipati sir is having more than 13 years of experience in bioanalytical method development and validation sir had developed and validated more than 50 bioanalytical methods for molecules in biological matrices using lcms sir is having vast experience in design planning and execution of adme and preclinical pharmacokinetic pk studies and pharmacokinetic analysis of pk data sir is having working experience with elisa cell culture and isolation and characterization of monoclonal antibodies sir have authored more than 20 peer review articles so we are having an excellent speaker over right now thank you pavan sir for accepting our invitation and sharing your giving your valuable time for spending for bitao college Sir, now you can share your screen and start your presentation, sir. Pavan, sir. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Um, I thank Dr. Gopal Krishnan Murthy Garu for this opportunity, and uh, I also thank uh, Sushma for introducing me. Today, I will be talking about basic understanding of bioanalysis and its applications in different phases of drug discovery and development. 
I request everyone to reserve your questions till the end of the presentation. Without further delay, uh, let's move on to the presentation. So the outline for today's presentation will be overview of bioanalysis, mm -hmm. where I'll be talking about big picture of bioanalysis, followed by uh, LCM SMS instrumentation. And also I'll be talking about method development, validation, Correct, sir. Oh. PPT is not appearing, sir. Is it not updating? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You just uh, just... Again, you just again start sharing, sir. Once again. Oh. Um, is it not moving to? Uh, it is not advancing slides. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, no, uh, any slides are appearing on the screen, sir. Okay. Yes, now maximize it, sir, and then you can proceed, sir. Yeah. Thank I you. I hope you guys can see right now, right? Yes, yes, thank you, thank you, sir. Yeah, no problem. Sorry for the interruption. There is a technical glitch there. So uh, once again, uh, uh, today's presentation's outline would be an overview of bioanalysis, where I'll be talking about big picture of bioanalysis. And I'll talk about LCMSMS instrumentation and various other instruments that are used uh, in bioanalysis. And I'll talk about method development followed by validation and its application for sample analysis. And we'll look at some of the uh, guidelines by uh, different regulatory authorities worldwide. So what is bioanalysis? The analogy I would use is searching for a pin in a haystack. Imagine how difficult it would be to find a pin in a haystack like this. So how this is done? through a combination of extraction, separation, and detection. So thank, no worries, thanks to uh, advancements in uh, chromatography and LCMS instrumentation, which made uh, lives of bioanalytical method scientists job easy. There are various areas where bioanalysis is employed, like in pharmaceuticals, forensic, clinical, uh, and in several other areas. But for today's presentation, my focus will be on pharmaceutical application of bioanalysis. So bioanalysis is uh, broadly divided into two different areas, small molecule bioanalysis and large molecule bioanalysis. Small molecules, meaning uh, molecular weights, anything below 900 Daltons, and the large molecules, have uh, molecular weights between 3,000 to 150,000. Small molecule, uh, example of small molecule would be paracetamol, it's a simple example. For large molecules, large molecules are like peptides, proteins, monoclonal antibodies, antibody drug conjugates, oligonucleotides, etc. Our presentation will be focused mainly on small molecules and small molecules uh, quantify, either it can be quantified or qualitatively be done. So our focus will be on quantitative aspect. So quantitative uh, small molecule bioanalysis is further um, divided into three sections, like method development, method validation, and sample analysis. There are various instruments that are employed for bioanalysis, small, especially for small molecule bioanalysis. HPLC, UPLC, LCMSMS, ICP-OES or ICP-MS. During 1980s, HPLC was used as a uh, major instrument or the primary instrument for small molecule bioanalysis. Currently, LCMSMS is the instrument of choice uh, because of its high sensitivity and specificity compared to other instruments. 
ICP OES and ICP MS are used for metal bioanalysis. The uh, instrument on the right, right hand side of the picture, is uh, a, an LCMS MS from ABCIX. I'll be discussing about LCMS MS. Um, in detail about its operation, principle, and mechanism. So let's start with liquid chromatography, which is often called a uh, front end uh, by mass spectrometrists. The components involved, as you know, are mobile face reservoir, pump, auto sampler, column, and detector. Of course, uh, all the systems are connected with the data acquisition. I'll not go deep into uh, this uh, slide because this is something most of you are familiar with. But I want to mention column and mobile face selection are the two things that analyst uh, trembles with. So there are various uh, stationary faces that one can choose from and there are uh, various mobile faces that one can uh, choose. In terms of detector, there are various detectors like UV, ELS, RID, fluorescence, and mass spectrometer. Here I'll be talking about mass spectrometer as a detector. So this is the layout of mass spectrometer. We have seen LC as front end in the previous slide. The LC effluent from the column is connected to the ion source. From the column outlet, it is connected to the ion source. And then where the molecules get ionized, in the ion source molecule gets ionized, and then they'll be uh, pulled into the mass analyzer due to high vacuum. In the mass analyzer, ions are detected, and the ions are separated, and the ions are detected by ion detector. There are different ion sources like electrons, electron spray ionization, atmospheric pressure chemical ionization, atmospheric pressure photo ionization, and MALD uh, stands for uh, matrix assisted laser desorption ionization. Similarly, there are different mass analyzers like quadrupole, ion trap, time of, time of flight, orbit trap, and Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass analyzer. And there are three different detectors as well, paradigm cup, uh, electron channel multiplier, and photomultiplier. I will talk about ESI and quadrupole. Quadrupole is most commonly used analyzer for quantitative bioanalysis, whereas TOF, ion, ion trap, orbit trap, and FTICR are used for uh, qualitative analysis, especially for biologics. The combination of ESI and quadrupole is highly successful in quantitative bioanalysis. I will talk about the mechanism of ESI and quadrupole uh, operation in detail. The basic criteria for mass spectrometer is to ionize the molecule in the ion source. The LC flow from the, uh, from the column outlet is connected to ion source, which this is called the source probe, where the mobile face is nebulized through nebulizer gas. Most commonly, either it is argon or nitrogen. The mobile face passes through the probe where it gets nebulized by gas, and then the simultaneously high voltage is applied to uh, form charged droplets. In the source, there is a high temperature that is applied to evaporate the solvent shell, and eventually, due to Coulomb explosion, the droplet gets exploded into individual ions, which are then pulled into quadrupole region due to high vacuum.
So once now that the ions entered the quadrupole, what happens? What happens with the ions? How they travel, and how they make it to hit the detector? Quadrupole is basically an arrangement of four uh, parallel rods that are two of them are connected to positive direct current, and two of them are correct. Connected to negative direct current. Also, additionally, radio frequency voltage is also applied at a fixed frequency that oscillates between positive and negative charge. Once the quadrupole make it to the uh, ion trajectory, this is called ion trajectory. At any RF by DC potential setting, only ions of one particular uh, mass to charge ratio have stable trajectory. So meaning uh, they can make it to hit the ion detector. The rest of the rest of the ions that could not make stable ion trajectory hit the quadrupoles and could not make uh, cannot make it to hit the detector, ion detector. We have learned there are different mass analyzers in the previous slide. Tandem mass spectrometry implies that these, these independent mass analyzers are connected together to get better performance. There are different tandem mass spectrometers available in available commercially. They are triple quadrupole, Q-trap, Q-tof, Tof-tof, and quadrupole orbitrap. Triple quadrupole is most commonly used instrument for quantitative small molecule bioanalysis. And Tof-tof and Q-tof and orbitrap are mostly majorly used for biologics, especially for qualitative uh, analysis. I'll talk about quadrupole um, operation principle in detail. So this is the layout of triple quadrupole instrument. Here we can see the ion source and quadrupole region. The LC outlet is connected here at the uh, um, LC pro, um, ion source pro and the Solvent droplets are evaporated here, which we have learned already in the previous slide. And what happens with the formed ions enters uh, through the orifice plate. This is orifice plate and it enters through the Q region and Q0 region and enters the quadrupole region where uh, they form this stable trajectory, ion trajectory, and then hit the detector. But how these we have learned about single quadrupole, but how these three quadrupoles connected and how the ions uh, make it to hit the detector. We'll see uh, in a minute. In these three quadrupoles, Q1 and Q3 have the same function, whereas Q2 is the collision cell where it fragments the uh, molecules nothing else. So Q1 and Q3, how do they function? There are uh, two different scan types. One is fixed mode and the other one is scan mode. In the scan mode, quadrupole tries to scan the entire range. Uh, imagine if you give a range from 100 to 500, if your molecular weight is between this, and if you want to scan anything between 100 to 500, in the scan mode, quadrupole scans and sends everything between 100 to 500 to the, to the ion detector. In the fixed, whereas in the fixed mode, you will select a single ion. Imagine you have selected 200, molecular weight with 200. Q1 allows only particular ion, that is 200, and then it will be sent to Q2. In Q2, which is a collision cell, it, it gets fragmented and the fragment ion gets transferred to Q3, where, um, where again is a, in a fixed mode, uh, it transfers, it transmits the formed fragment ion to the ion detector. Let's 
let's move on to uh, bioanalytical method development i consider these three uh, parameters like sample preparation mass spec optimization and chromatography optimization are major areas uh, one should know about um, before dealing with method development so moving on to sample preparation we should know about something about biological matrices there are different biological matrices the most routinely uh, dealed plasma uh, dealed biological matrix is plasma there are other biological fluids like um, cerebrospinal fluid and cervical vaginal fluid etc at times it is mandatory to uh, study drug concentration in tissues like liver kidney spleen and brain and also in cells like pbmcs and rbc uh, red blood cells um, pbmcs are by the way uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells so tissues and cells sometimes tissue, uh, studies are warranted to uh, look at the concentration in uh, these matrices to study the tissue distribution pattern of the molecule dried blood spot this is a uh, micro sampling technique it is still not accepted by uh, regulatory authorities for especially for anda submissions but this is a very good technique where um, the sample volume is limited like in the case of uh, preclinical setups where uh, uh, studies are being conducted on mice and uh, rats where the sample volume is usually less than 200 microliter there are different extraction techniques to uh, get cleaner sample because we cannot directly inject plasma or tissues on the lcm sms so we need those samples to be cleaned up so what are the ways to clean the sample they are protein precipitation liquid liquid extraction solid phase extraction solid phase micro extraction solid liquid extraction ppt lle and sp are the most commonly or most widely used methods extraction methods protein precipitation more majority of the drugs are protein bound so when we add organic solvents acids or salts what happens to the protein is proteins crumble and they precipitate and leaving the drugs in the solution so the most commonly used organic solvents are acetonitrile methanol ethanol and acetone and there are some acids like trichloroacetic acid perchloric acid even the salts are used zinc sulfate and ammonium sulfate i would say the most commonly used reagents are acetonitrile methanol ethanol and acetone the procedure for protein precipitation involves sample is added to 1:4 uh, in the in the ratio of 1:4 ratio of uh, precipitating reagent that is uh, these containing internal standard we'll talk about internal standard in the coming slides what takes the sample to aggregate the proteins and uh, they are and the sample is centrifuged to uh, sediment the protein and the super uh, and the supernatant can be directly injected onto lcm sms or it can be dried or diluted depending on the um, necessity of, of the sensitivity so the next uh, sample preparation technique is liquid liquid extraction the mechanism involved here is like dissolves like so in the liquid liquid extraction since the plasma is aqueous we will add some invisible solvents that are listed here in the table here so most commonly used are these solvents so how do we select a solvent based how, how do we select a solvent as i said like dissolves like if your drug's log p value is say 1.5 you would select dichloromethane right so 
you add the solvent, immiscible solvent, organic solvent to the plasma and then extract it. How the drug partitions is through diffusion. Sometimes it is mandatory to add um, buffers to adjust the pH of uh, pH of the sample. Why is it required? So as you know, when the compounds are in ionic state, they are more polar than when they are in non-ionic state. So we are dealing with non-polar solvents here. And if the molecule is non-polar and it is ionic, it will be in polar state. So it is mandatory to adjust the pH of the sample to a neutral state so that it can diffuse into organic phase. What is the general procedure used here? Like to the sample, we add organic solvent. And if it is required, we adjust the sample adjust the pH and then vertex the sample for a few minutes and then centrifuge the sample to sediment the plasma. Usually the aqueous layer is sedimented down due to the high density. And in some cases when dichloromethane is used, um, aqueous layer can be on top of organic layer. Um, and, and the supernatant and organic layer is separated. Since the organic layer, uh, these organic solvents are not compatible to inject directly onto LCMS. We dry down and then reconstitute with mobile phase and then eventually inject it onto LCMS. Solid phase extraction. This is the most selective and the cleanest sample providing sample extraction technique. The mechanism involved is very similar to chromatography so there are different stationary phases that are used here. Um, C18, like reverse phase, HLB, which is called hydrophilic lipophilic balance, and ion exchange and mixed mode. C18 works best for polar, um, polar to moderately polar to non-polar molecules, where the where the sorbent ket bed can retain uh, your analyte of interest, and then the polar interferences can be washed out. For molecules where the where it has hydrophilic and lipophilicity, both of them in balance, or a proportion of hydrophilicity and lipophilicity in the same molecule, you can use hydro HLB cartridges. And in some cases, ion exchange cartridges, cartridges are useful where you are not, where sorry, uh, where the matrix effect is unavoidable. So in those cases, you need uh, ion exchange cartridges. If you say, if your molecule has ionizable groups, you can ionize, you, you can ionize in the sample and then they can attach to the sorbent bed which, ha which has ionic component and rest of the uh, other interferences can be washed away and you can elute your sample elute your analyte, which gives the cleanest sample. Um, so solid phase extraction is um, tedious and expensive compared to uh, PPT, PPT, or which is uh, protein precipitation or LLE. Mixed mode is, once again, is a combination of HLB and ion exchange. Uh, this is also um, used when uh, matrix effect is unavoidable or your uh, suffering with uh, extraction recovery. So what is the general procedure for uh, solid phase extraction? You prepare the sample by adjusting the, temp adjusting the pH or diluting the sample. And then you have to condition the cartridge, condition the cartridge, meaning you have to wet the solvent bed with uh, some solvent. And then you Pass the uh, pass the sample onto the sorbent bed. You, you need to wash the sor sorbent bed in order to avoid uh, potential interfering substances. And then, now that your analytes on the sorbent sorbent bed and you wash the potential interference, you can elute with um, organic solvents like methanol, um, estonitrile, and this. Uh, Eluent can be evaporated, reconstituted, and injected, injected onto LCM-SMS. 
Moving on to mass spectrometer ionization, sorry, mass spectrometer optimization. There are two different um, parameters that one needs to optimize. One is ion source parameter, source parameter optimization, and the other is compound dependent parameter optimization. Source parameter optimization involves ion spray voltage, temperature, nebulizer gas pressure, and curtain gas. As these, by name itself, describes the describes their function. Ion spray voltage um, applies the voltage in order to uh, form the charged droplets. Temperature evaporates the solvent shell. Nebulizer gas nebulizes the uh, mobile phase that is coming through the probe. And the cutting gas, which is uh, a gas applied through uh, cutting plate cut-in plate in order to avoid solvent droplets entering the Q0 region, which eliminates the uh, contamination of this uh, region. We don't want uh, solvent molecules to enter. We want only the ions to enter this region. So compound dependent parameter optimization. Um, there are different parameters, declustering potential, entering, entrance potential, collision energy, and collision cell entrance potential. What is declustering potential? Declustering potential is applied on the orifice plate to decluster the uh, ions. And collision energy is applied here in the collision cell. Um, by the way, these are all potentials um, applied in, in voltages. So entrance potential and cell exit potential are applied on stubbies before and after the collision cell, which narrows down the entrance of uh, the ions and exit of the ions. Chromatography optimization. I'll not go deep into this section because this is vast and um, this is also very familiar to most of you, uh, which is very similar to HPLC method development. Now, but there are a very few solvents um, and buffers that one can choose. Unlike in HPLC, there are vast number of solvents uh, you can use as mobile phase. But coming to LCMS, there are only few uh, organic solvents. Most of the times, I would say 99% of the times, you use methanol and acetonitrile combination of uh, buffers. So formic acid, acetic acid, ammonium acetate, ammonium formate, and ammonia are most widely used uh, buffers for mobile phase. And column, column chemistry is very similar once again uh, to HPLC or UPLC. So the only uh, difference that I would mention here is uh, we use very short columns most of the times 50 mm or maybe 75 mm columns. Uh, there are different stationary phases, as you know, C18, the reverse phase, C8, phenyl, helic, and there are ion exchange as well. And uh, yeah, and another uh, significant difference is since the columns are short, the retention times are short and run times are, yes, they are short. And the injection volumes, um, in my experience, the lowest I used was um, 0.5 microliter. Um, unlike in HPLC, we go up to maybe sometimes 50, 25, 50 microliter as well. But in LCMS, we go uh, at the most 20, but most of the times 5 microliter. Now that we have come across sample preparation, method development, method, me method development, Sorry, as a part of method development, we have come across uh, sample preparation, chromatography optimization, and mass spectra optimization. Now that you have given a molecule like this, what are the appropriate parameters for initial trial? Where do you start? So where do we start? We need, we need to look at the properties of a molecule. We cannot, we cannot simply uh, take up the molecule and start using some uh, solvent, some extraction technique. 
we need to take a look at the properties. Since this clofazamine molecule is well known, you can uh, search the internet or uh, search the literature and uh, get these values. But if it is not known, it's a new uh, compound, I mean, synthesized in the lab, say NCE, uh, new chemical entity. How do you develop a method for that? There are uh, softwares available, free softwares like ChemSketch, Marvin Sketch. In silico, you can do, uh, you, you can get these details uh, like PK and log P. Of course, you cannot get these values, but you can get uh, PK and log P value. Um, these are the primary parameters that you need um, to know what parameters you should be using for initial trial. So for clofazamine, the PK is uh, 8.5 and 5.1, um, which is a basic. Uh, and uh, so when the molecule is basic, and if you have acidic environment, the molecule gets ionized. We have learned the basic parameter or the basic fundamental uh, criteria for mass spectrometer, mass spectrometer is to ionize the molecule. So for pKa 8.5, you would select acidic pH in the mobile device. So formic acid, there are a couple of options uh, as we have discussed in the previous slide formic acid, ammonium formate, ammonium acetate. So in, in this case, you can start with 0.1% formic acid. Since this molecule has log P value, high log P value, I would say uh, 7.66 is very high, um, meaning very hydrophobic or lipophilic. So you would start with uh, high percentage of organic and low percentage of aqueous. I would say 70-30. Um, and uh, coming to sample extraction, now the molecule has, this molecule has protein binding of 85, which is high. Um, you can directly uh, go ahead with protein precipitation and um, um, try methanol or acetonitrile protein precipitation or acetone protein precipitation. But as I said, protein precipitation uh, has uh, high, uh, high chances of matrix effect, meaning uh, there could be some potential interference um, that could be affecting, affecting the ionization of your analyte of interest in the ion source. So in that case, since this molecule has a log P value of 7.66, you can uh, also explore LLE because LLE uh, works best for molecules with log p value greater than one. Um, with log p values less than one, um, I would say, or maybe if it is a negative, uh, LLE may not work as best. So internal standard, uh, you need to choose a best internal standard for your method uh, to be rendered. So there are two options, um, structural analogs or labeled internal standard. Structural analogs um, are like um, the ones that are similar in structure or similar in physical chemical properties as that of your analyte of interest. And labeled internal standards are C13 or deteriorated internal standards. Um, I would say in most of the times in uh, drug development phase, um, we use labeled internal standard because they compensate for matrix effects. Structural analogs are best for, uh, for molecules when uh, they are in drug discovery stage because these are expensive uh, to make. And the uh, secondary parameters that you need to consider while developing a method are metabolites. Are there any metabolites for this molecule which could uh, impact um, the determination of this drug? And is there any stability? Some, some drugs, like especially esters, uh, are prone to hydrolysis when uh, it is in plasma. We'll talk about this stability uh, in the coming slides. Moving on to method validation. Um, there are different parameters that uh, you need to validate uh, to prove that your method is rugged. 
So the parameters uh, that you need to test are selectivity and specificity, sensitivity, precision and accuracy, carryover, extraction recovery, matrix effect, dilution integrity, and stability, various stability experiments like bench top, freeze top, auto sampler, and long-term stability. I'll talk about what, the, what these terms are and how they do. How do we conduct experiment for these? Method validation. It is um, a very dry subject. Um, there are many number of values and test procedures. Um, I would say these are very widely available in the regulatory guidelines. I'll talk about what these experiments are, why uh, they are needed to perform during validation. Um, I, I'll give a uh, little explanation of the test procedure as well, but not in detail. So the selectivity. Why the selectivity is performed as a part of validation? Uh, selectivity is the ability of method to differentiate and measure the analyte in presence of potential interfering substances. Meaning your method should be able to differentiate um, your analyte of interest from the endogenous matter substances. substances. So how do this uh, test perform? Um, so the, uh, the guidelines suggest that you need to select six different uh, plasma from six different volunteers or six different mice or six different rat. And then uh, you need to extract um, in the developed method and you need to check uh, the interference uh, against LLOQ, which is a lower limit of quantification. It should be less than 20% and 5% for IS. So uh, the specificity, specificity, uh, the ability of method to detect and differentiate the analyte from other substances. So the criteria remains same for uh, selectivity and uh, uh, selectivity and specificity. Sensitivity. Uh, sensitivity is the, the ability of the method or the confidence of the method, develop the method um, to determine LLOQ in a, in a precisive way. So how, how this is performed? You need to inject LLOQ um, for five times and then see uh, the accuracy and the precision or accuracy is the uh, plus or minus 20% of the nominal concentration, and the precision is uh, uh, below 20%. I'm sorry, this is uh, this should be 20%, not plus or minus. So the next experiment is carryover. So what is carryover? Imagine if, if you have injected a lower concentration sample immediately after higher concentration, they, if there is a carryover in method, from the higher concentration, there, there will be a chance, a chance that some of the uh, fraction of the compound could be analyzed in the subsequent injection that is in the lower uh, concentrated sample and which can impact a true value of that uh, sample. So in order to um, test this, we need to inject a blank sample immediately after your uh, ULOQ sample that is uh, upper limit of quantification and see uh, there is any carryover. And the uh, criteria for carryover is it should be less than 20% of LLOQ. Matrix effect. Um, I told you in the previous slides that I will introduce matrix effect. Matrix effect is the huge concern for uh, bioanalytical method scientists. Um, it affects their life in a huge way. Um, an alteration, so what is matrix effect? An alteration of analyte response due to interfering and often unidentified components in the mat sample matrix. So plasma is a biological matrix which has so many compounds, like you have vitamins, hormones, um, peptides, proteins, um, metabolites various other compounds, which can directly affect your uh, analyte of interest, or it can fragment and then affect your 
quantification, quantification of your unlock of interest. So how does this affect these four eluents? These are called four eluents that elute at the same time, though they don't have, uh, though they may not have a similar molecule, same molecular weight of your compound of interest, but they can elute at the same time from the column as your analyte, which can um, suppress or enhance the ionization in the ion source. So when the ions are suppressed, your ions are your uh, compounds ions are suppressed. If you are supposed to see hundred, if the, there is a uh, matrix effect due to suppression, you might see nothing, or you might see something of your analyte. That means your signal is varied um, with the coiluent. If there is a matrix ion enhancement, what happens if your molecule is supposed to see at 100 height? I'm talking about height, uh, 100 as height. You will, you might see at 200. So that means you are overreading your concentrations. In matrix suppression, you are uh, underreading your concentrations. So that's why uh, you need to perform matrix effect as part of validation and uh, prove that there is no matrix effect. Uh, I will talk about um, how to mitigate uh, this matrix effect. Um, as I said previously, if you can use labeled internal standard uh, that can compensate for matrix effect, or you need to uh, optimize your chromatography so that the compounds are eluted uh, in different times. I mean, co are eluted at different times. Now, uh, coming to extraction recovery. Extraction recovery is how efficiently you extract your drug uh, from the biological matrix into a mobile phase or the uh, extracting solvent. Um, it need not be 100%, but it should be consistent um, throughout the calibration range. Uh, from lowest to highest, it should be consistent. Uh, it cannot be um, X percent at lower level, Y percent at a uh, higher level. It, it should be consistent at um, all, all the throughout the concentration range, uh, standard curve concentration range. Um, how this is, how the extraction recovery is performed, um, uh, these experiments, both are more, matrix effect and extraction recovery are more or less performed uh, in the similar way, uh, but but they are compared. So extraction recovery is uh, compared with uh, blank samples, uh, extracted blank samples spiked, and then uh, they are compared against the extracted sample areas. I don't want to go detail into it. Uh, it will be confusing at this point. Calibration curve. So this is the heart of the uh, your essay. If you are running a samples, to, if you are running some samples today, and calibration curve stands as a heart. Um, if your calibration curve uh, fails, you have to dump your uh, results, standard results. I mean, sample results. So, how is this calibration curve uh, determined or uh, plotted? We uh, use blank, that is um, matrix blank, matrix blank. Uh, plus IS, there is no drug that is called zero standard, and minimum of six um, standards um, from lowest to highest range. Um, and uh, the plot, calibration curve plot, is plotted again. Uh, X axis is uh, concentration, and Y axis is peak area ratio, where analyte area and IS area are uh, taken in ratio. And most of the times, and even the regulatory authorities suggest that uh, we have to use simpler model, um, like linear, linear one by x squared. And the criteria for passing criteria for the standard curve is uh, um, accuracy should be 15% um, of the nominal concentration and 20% for the LLOQ. And 75% of the six standards um, should meet. And precision and accuracy is uh, the how consistent uh, are your results. You need to uh, perform at least three precision and accuracy runs as a part of validation. Uh, in one precision run, you should have uh, four levels of QCs. 
and five replicates of each. And the uh, passing criteria is once again, accuracy should be 15% uh, and 20% uh, for LLOQ and the precision should be 15%. Dilution integrity. So what is dilution integrity? Why do we need to perform as a part of validation? Imagine you have a uh, sample concentration that is way above your ULOQ, that is your upper limit of quantification. If it is way above, how do we do that? Do we perform method validation once again? Need not be. Um, we, can, we, we can prove that the higher concentration samples upon diluting and extracting and injecting will give the same result. I mean, will give the um, known concentration that we spike. Imagine your ULOQ is 1,000 nanogram and you got 2,000 nanogram concentration. So how do we do about it? We can dilute it one is to four times so that it will fall in your calibration range and then uh, inject it. For that, we need to prove um, dilution integrity will give uh, gives us the same value. We, can, we have to inject uh, at least five replicates of uh, concentration that is uh, above ULOQ, and then see that accuracy and precision are within the specifications. Stability. Stability of the compound in biological matrix is a huge concern sometimes. There are compounds that are um, quickly uh, degrade when the sample is as soon as it is collected and kept on bench top. Or sometimes um, they are not stable on free stock. Sometimes they are not stable and they are stored, e stored even at minus 80 degrees centigrade. So there are different uh, conditions that we face uh, from the sample collection to the sample processing. So we need to prove that the compound remains stable during these conditions, that is bench stock, free stock, auto sampler, and long term. What are these bench what, what is this bench stop stability? Bench stop stability meaning you have collect, say that you have collected plasma sample and you have stored it on bench top. Is it stable? If it is stable, for how long it is stable? We need not we need not see uh, until it degrades, but we can see for a certain period of time and then make sure your sample is not on bench top beyond that time. So bench top stability and free stop stability. Some compounds uh, degrade when, when they are free stored more than n number of times. Say uh, you froze your plasma sample and thawed it today and then froze it, thawed it, froze, thawed, so compounds might degrade on free thaw cycles. So we need to prove that your compound is stable for certain period of cycles, like one free thaw cycle, three free thaw cycles, free thaw cycles, um, something like that. So auto sampler stability. At times, it is possible that you have extracted your sample and instrument is down. So what you can do, you can leave the samples in auto sampler or you can uh, store it in refrigerator at certain temperature, but you have to prove that at those temperatures, even the process sample is stable. Long-term stability. Um, you have collected the samples today and uh, you have stored it for X, uh, X number of days in the, refrigerator, in the deep freezer. Is, is your compound stable for those many number of days? You, you need to check uh, as a part of uh, stability experiment in uh, method validation. So the criteria, once again, it is um, plus or minus 15% of the nominal concentration. Uh, by the way, nominal is the known concentration that we spike into uh, matrix. So what are the applications of bioanalysis? It is, um, the bioanalytical methods um, are useful in the bio, bio availability and bioequivalent studies. And they are also useful um, in uh, preclinical in vivo pharmacokinetic studies. 
um, and ADME studies um, like PAMPA, uh, CACO2, protein binding assay, metabolic stability, etc. BABE studies are uh, mostly conducted in uh, uh, humans and preclinical mostly uh, in uh, different animals like right from uh, mice to macaques, monkeys. ADME studies are mostly cell-based uh, in vitro studies. Uh, PAMPA is a uh, absorption assay. CACO2 is once again an absorption assay, but this is an artificial membrane and CACO2 is a cell, cell line based assay. Protein binding assay is, is once again an in vitro assay. Metabolic stability um, is to check um, how stable your molecule is in the, uh, in the plasma. It, it, this is not something uh, that is similar to the metabolic, uh, the disability that we have discussed previously. This metabolic stability is something uh, that needs to be, that, that, uh, that is something related to uh, liver enzymes. In presence of liver enzymes, how stable your molecule is. So in all these phases, um, bioanalytical methods are employed. Um, regulatory guidelines. There are several uh, regulatory agencies uh, worldwide that uh, have published bioanalytical guidelines, bioanalytical method validation guidelines, and also documentation guidelines. So in GLP, um, if you are developing, if you are validating a method for uh, a molecule, and it uh, if it is a part of ANDA submission or NDA submission. NDA is abbreviated new drug application or new drug applications. Um, then your method should be validated as per the regulatory guideline. Um, and it should be specifically um, the region where it goes to. Suppose if your, um, if your submission is going to USFDA, you need to follow USFDA guidelines. USFDA, EMEA, and ANVISA more or less have the similar guidelines. And OECD guidelines are especially for uh, preclinical uh, studies, preclinical pharmacokinetic studies. And there are some uh, non-GLP studies where um, bioanalysis is employed, but uh, regulatory guidelines usually does not apply here uh, because this is discovery, because something is not concrete here. So you don't apply any uh, regulatory guidelines here, like ADME, metabolite identification, um, biomarker identification, and metabolomics. Uh, these are non-GLP um, experiments. And I would like to thank um, hosts and Dr. Uh, Gopala Krishna Murtigaru for giving this opportunity to share, to share my thoughts on this topic. Um, and also, I would like to thank uh, Sushma and Ranjit Garu for uh, uh, arranging uh, this virtual stage. With this, I would like to leave uh, the floor for questions um, you may have. Yeah, thank you once again. Thank you, Pavan sir, for your crystal clear, simplified explanation on this topic. I hope the student participants might be clear about this topic. So I'll refer the chat box and I'll ask the questions which the participants have arised. So the first question from participants is, how are tissue samples processed? Yeah, um, so these uh, tissue samples are solid matrices. Um, So plasma, plasma you can aspirate, uh, you can you can take take with pipette. But uh, tissues are tissues have to be minced, homogenized uh, before it could be uh, processed, same as plasma. But how are they uh, homogenized? Um, there are different tissues, right? Like liver, liver is a soft tissue, and brain is a soft tissue. But if you take skin tissue, it is a hard tissue. Um, Soft tissues can be directly homogenized just with um, um, miniature scissors. You need to mince the tissue and uh, you, need, you need to add the beads. There are different ways to homogenize, by the way, uh, mechanical homogenization and chemical homogenization. 
but most commonly what we use is uh, mechanical homogenization where you mince the uh, tissue with the scissors and you add beads these are small um, uh, stainless steel or silicon dioxide beads you need to add and then uh, there is a machine called bullet blender uh, you need to stir it then the uh, tissue becomes homogenized uh with the to the homogenate you can uh, directly add uh, some pbs or saline and then treat that as a uh, liquid matrix okay sir the next question i'll take up sir the question is could you tell us the general flow of bioanalytical method development yeah um so there are uh, different ways um generally uh, i have uh, talked about like um, if you are given a molecule um if it is known molecule yes you will uh, go for literature search and then uh, uh, get the properties of the molecule if it is not known you need to plug that structure into um software in silico search i mean in silico you can uh, develop you can determine uh, values with the values you need you need to come up with the um, initial parameters that you need to use so the flow is like this once you have the parameters uh, once you once you know what parameters you need to use for uh, initial trial the first thing that you need to do is the uh, mass spectrometer uh, optimization that means you prepare um, some 1 uh, microgram per ml concentration of neat drug that is uh, just the drug in uh, organic solution organic solvent and you inject onto uh, mass spec only no front end just the mass spec um, you, you you determine the q1 and q3 and the mass spec parameters then uh, shoot it onto uh, lc msms uh, lc through lc and determine how the peak shape is um, if the peak shape is good and uh, you are okay with the reproducibility then you need to extract the sample uh, from the biological matrix um initially i would say start with uh, protein precipitation if the protein binding is higher and then eventually you can uh, uh, explore lle if the log p is higher than 1 um if you if you have any problems with matrix effect i would say um, sp is ideal sir the next question is from student participant sir is bioanalytical method development applicable for all drugs or is there any criteria to choose those drugs um so bioanalytical method development is applicable to all the drugs um say there are as i said there are different different areas that you employ bioanalytical methods right right from um metabolomics bio uh, metabolites um tk studies tk studies so for everywhere you need a method development but for biologics and uh, metabolites the procedure may vary a little bit but for small molecule quantification this is the flow and uh, yes it is required for most of the molecules the next question sir if the molecule is unstable in biological matrix what are the strategies that you employ to eliminate degradation okay um yeah this is uh, challenging if the molecule is not stable in biological matrix um so before you collect samples at clinic uh, in clinical trial or bab studies or even in uh, uh, animal studies before you collect the sample you need to add stabilizer um suppose say uh, there is an ester drug and it is prone to hydrolysis and become acid so you need to add some stabilizer um to stop the ester hydrolysis uh, you need to add um, a stabilizer before you collect the sample to the uh, vacutainer or the sample collecting vial or there are some other different ways uh, if it is not stable during the sample extraction uh, you need to check where it is uh, which condition is not uh, appropriate for that uh, for that molecule you need to minimize that
Just a magic, sir. I'm taking the questions back. Yeah. So the next question, what are the differences between structural analog and labeled internal standard? What are yeah. the differences between structural analog and labeled internal standards? Okay. So um, structural analogs are uh, structurally similar to uh, your molecules of interest uh, or the analog of interest. Uh, the sim there is no uh, hard and fast rule that uh, you need to uh, select 90% uh, similar to your molecule, 95% similar or 100% similar or 99% similarity. It depends on uh, what are the properties, how similar are the properties of your internal standard to that of your analyte, in, analyte of interest. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, sir. Yeah, uh, I didn't complete yet. So, um, deteriorated standard or labeled standards are very similar. Uh, very similar, meaning just the hydrogens are replaced with deuterium. So, they act or they have the very similar physical chemical properties as that of your molecule. If you see in, uh, an LCMS uh, a spectrum, they will elute at the same time. Uh, that's why they are not recommended for HPLC. Whereas structural analogs can elute at different times. Um, but for bioanalysis, um, labeled internal standards are the uh, ideal. Yeah. Sir, from my side, I'm having a question, sir. You mentioned yeah. that matrix effect is major drawback of protein precipitation. Is, it, mm -hmm. is there any mm -hmm. way to minimize matrix effects, sir? Yes. Uh, so if it is coming from protein precipitation, um, there are a couple of ways. Um, is it <coughs> because of a particular solvent? Like you can use, as I said, you can use methanol, acetonitrile, acetone, or some other acids or salts, right? You can choose uh, if methanol, if the uh, matrix effect is coming from methanol, you, then you can switch the solvents to uh, other solvent. But in most of the times, if the matrix effect is coming from one solvent, it, it would also come from other uh, solvents because proteins uh, are precipitated in the similar way if you use uh, acids or, I mean, if you use any solvent or acids or salts. So proteins will precipitate and uh, the co eluents um, will be in the solution with your molecule. So for that, uh, what you can do is uh, subsequent um, sample processing or the other way is to um, separate your molecule uh, from the uh, co-eluents. Uh, the most ideal thing is uh, go with gradient, gradient uh, separation so that your molecule of interest separates uh, from co eluents So gradient is one way. And the other way is uh, there are some uh, phospholipid removal plates. So matrix effect usually comes from, uh, it is believed actually, it is believed that matrix effect comes from phospholipids. So there are some phospholipid removal cartridges available. You can pass your samples through that. Sometimes that might work. So great. Okay, sir, one more question in the chat box, sir. How bioanalysis helps in microchip chromatography? Microchip chromatography. Yes, uh, yeah, microchip chromatography can be used um, in bioanalysis, um, but not necessarily it, uh, other way around. Uh, can be used chiral uh, stationary phases here, sir, in this bioanalytical technique? Yes. So at times, uh, you, I mean, uh, levo and dextro or L or uh, um, R is uh, very much possible um, in bioanalysis too. Uh, say a molecule like warfarin. So you have uh, both uh, diastereomers and you want to uh, resolute. Yes, you need the chiral columns. Uh, not necessarily you have to use chiral columns. At times, uh, you can use 
uh, reverse phased or not uh, reverse phased column and still resolute uh, still you can get uh, proper resolution but yes chiral columns are uh, best for the uh, good resolution sir is there any method development for protein high molecular weight drugs any separate method yes. development for this yes so for large molecules um, the sample processing is little different because uh, uh, proteins have high molecular weight and uh, there is a limitation for mass spectrometers right uh, they cannot uh, quantify or they cannot detect molecular weights um, higher than some x daltons so for that what we need to do is uh, we need to uh, trypsinize the protein means we need to break down the proteins into smaller peptides Uh, obviously, those peptides will have a small molecular weights. They can be detected. Yes, um, there is a different procedure for uh, biologics. Um, I would say it is twenty um, percent different from what I have already explained. So uh, you need to uh, deal with uh, abundant protein uh, elimination and uh, trypsinization and immuno precipitation. Yeah, techniques are little different compared to small molecule bioanalysis. Yes, sir. The last question, but it's a general question asked from many of the participants. That is, can you suggest some guidelines for students who want to do bioanalysis of their interested molecule as their project work in colleges? Sure. Um, so, US FDA uh, bioanalytical method validation. If you search on Google. Um, that is the most widely followed uh, guideline and it is very comprehensive guideline i would say um, and also you you can uh, look at uh, uh and these are guidelines but us fda is most widely used yeah. thank you sir for your crystal clear in ex explanation regarding all the topic and the questions explanation for all the participants that is the student participants might be clear about the session thank you for sharing yeah. your valuable time with us sir yeah um, i am open to uh, any questions if uh, one may have uh, they can shoot an email to me um, i i hope you have my email id yeah okay sir i'll be sharing your email id on youtube right now sir so if yeah. any doubts the participants can directly post on to you yeah thanks that's that's wonderful